Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Melinda Herring and I'm the Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center here at the Atlantic Council in Washington, DC. We're thrilled to have four phenomenal experts with us today for a discussion on why Ukraine can't keep waiting for justice. It's my pleasure to welcome Andy Hunter, President of the American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine. Welcome, Andy. It's also my pleasure to welcome Andre Kozlov, an attorney and former member of the High Qualification Commission of Judges. Welcome, Andre. Yaroslav Yershishin, a member of Parliament and first Deputy Chair of the Anti-Corruption Committee and the former head of Transparency International Ukraine. And my good friend, Mihailo Zhernikov, a former judge and the head of the Yuri Foundation. And today we're going to discuss how Ukraine's most urgent need, judicial reform, can be prioritized in Ukraine right now. So let's bring in our uh, our fine panelists. I'd like to invite everyone who's watching to please join this discussion. Uh, you can use the hashtag Future Ukraine if you're on Twitter, or you can type in your questions below if you're in the Zoom link. So let's get started. Gentlemen, I, I'd like to ask you, this may be an obvious question, I and mean, I want to start with Andy, but why is it so hard to make progress on judicial reform. We've seen President Poroshenko and President Zelensky make it a priority and give it lip service. Most experts regard it as the most crucial reform to Ukraine's eventual transformation. Uh, we know the bottom line is that courts remained unreformed and that FDI is flat. Andy, could you please hazard a guess for us? Why is it virtually impossible to get the courts right? I'd like to start with you, Andy. Well, uh, thank you, Melinda. I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head when you say this is the most crucial um, issue, uh, especially for, for business and for attracting uh, FDI. Um, you know, if we look where, where we are in terms of um, uh, the, the GDP uh, last year, 2019, we're looking at a nominal GDP of $150 billion. And that's still a good $30 billion less than what Ukraine had in 2013. And the forecast for uh, uh, the, the, this year is a contraction of around 8% of GDP. So what is the most important thing now is to attract uh, foreign direct investment. Um, we asked our, um, uh, the members of the American Chamber of Commerce, so what, what is the biggest obstacle? Who is the biggest barrier to uh, doing business in Ukraine? And the number one biggest barrier were the courts. 74% of businesses, um, you know, they see the courts as the biggest obstacle of doing business in Ukraine. And that's what deters uh, new companies entering the market, because if you can't get fair justice, um, and it's not looking for any privileges, you're just looking for a fair uh, uh, justice system. And um, that, that's what companies are looking for. So the problem, you know, we've identified the problem. Uh, this is the number one problem. And uh, for us, you know, in our 10 key steps in terms of boosting economic growth, Number one is real and effective judicial reform uh, and rule of law. So rule of law, you know, remains the number one issue. Um, and it hasn't happened. Um, why? Um, I think, you know, it all goes down to political will. Uh, the political will really of, um, ref, you know, we, are, we are all see and have identified this as the biggest uh, barrier. So I think, you know, until the political will is there to really push through judicial uh, reform and, you know, have real rule of law, I think, you know, we're, we're not going to see that. And I think now, I think the timing of this event is very, um, you know, it couldn't be better because now, especially in, in a post, as we prepare for a post-COVID world where, you know, countries are fighting for foreign direct investment. And, you know, if Ukraine can really push and um, start showing it serious on judicial reform, this could, you know, start sending a signal to um, um, uh, investors. And I think it's not only business. I mean, if we look at society, um, the, the, the numbers from the Razumkov Center uh, in February 2020, um, you know, they uh, polled the population. And uh, again, 74% of Ukrainians do not trust the courts. Only 32% uh, percent do. And I think, you know, that, that was um, the second most untrusted uh, institution. Uh, the first one being the most untrusted was Russian media. Uh, the second one, 74% <laughs> don't trust uh, the courts. That's saying something, Andy, for sure. Um, tell, tell us this, though. Um, is there any demand for judicial reform? This is a really hard reform to get right, right? There's been multiple attempts, um, and, and it's really complicated, and it's quite boring, to be honest. Do you see uh, demand in the business community? Absolutely. I mean, the demand is there. 
Um, why? Because, um, you know, it, it's not looking for privileges, it's looking for, for justice. So we're actually now, you know, looking at potential, um, you know, centers. Uh, we, we look what's happened in um, uh, countries where, um, like in, in Dubai, the financial center in um, uh, Astana or now in Nur Sultan, where you, you, you can get, um, a, a, you know, a setting up something new. And the question is, you know, is it possible to reform the old or is it better to start afresh and do, do some, something new? And I remember in the days when I, when I first came to Kiev in the 90s and uh, uh, I, I, I'm a big football fan or a soccer fan and um, uh, Dynamo Kiev used to always play Shakhtar. And whenever they came to Kiev or they went to the Netsk, the referee was always, you know, more loyal to the, the local um, team. So they said, okay, this isn't interesting anymore. So what do we do? So they started bringing referees from Italy. So you bring in international uh, referees. And I think that's what we're looking at also now is the possibility of having uh, a jurisdiction under the um, uh, jurisdiction of England and Wales, uh, sort of um, um, courts where there, where the judges would really be able, uh, and this would be for all kinds of uh, dispute resolution. So I think that is something we're looking at at the moment. You know, would that be possible in Ukraine? Interesting, interesting. I hadn't heard that the business community was pushing that reform. That's that's quite interesting. Uh, let me bring Michaela into this. Michaela, is it too late if you study the examples of judicial reform and, and court uh, cleanup in Eastern Europe uh, in the 90s? The ones, the countries that got it right pushed hard. They illustrated everyone. Uh, it's been six years since the Euromaidan. Has the momentum worn out? Is it too late to hope that, that Ukraine can get its courts right uh, this time and now? Hello, everybody. Really happy to be here. Thanks, Melinda, for a great question and for a timely discussion. Really, um, I don't think it's too late. I think it is necessary because if we're not fixing the courts, we're not going anywhere, not in terms of foreign direct investment or rule of law or any democratic transformation, to be honest. And, um, you know, uh, independent judiciary was at the core of the democratic transformation ever since uh, Magna Carta, at least on the European soil. So the same way it is not um, possible to um, have a democratic transformation without uh, the rule of law and the fact of judicial reform, the same way the oligarchy or the old ways cannot exist with the independent courts. That is why it is so important to really make it work right now. Uh, and it doesn't really matter Yes, it, it is true that the momentum was there, is more, more momentum there uh, right after the Maidan, but um, I think it still boils down to the political will of those people who are in power who make the decisions whether to go with a real judicial reform or not. Okay, great. Um, l let me ask you, gentlemen, to respond to Andy's idea uh, of um, using courts outside of Ukraine. Is, is that an idea that has any resonance uh, in your community, or are you focused on fixing the system the way it is. Um, Michaela, let's start with you and then we'll go to Andre and then to Yaroslav. Yeah, thanks Melinda. I think uh, it's not it's only what I think, it is what the civil society of Ukraine thinks, uh, the top um, civil society organi organizations that deal with judicial reform here. Uh, you probably know that uh, here in Ukraine, uh, the NGOs have a big role in, in, in a, uh, developing and pushing for reforms. So, um, the one counterexample of, because really the judicial reform was not very successful in the last years, was it? But there was one counterexample, which is the anti-corruption court that was formed differently. Turns out, and I absolutely agree here with Andy, that bringing in the referees, the international referees that have this, uh, that, do not, that are not connected with the so-called elites here, that cannot be bribed, that cannot be influenced, that bring this culture here and really um, kind of borrow um, or lend us some, so we can borrow from them, uh, um, integrity and good practices. And um, it, it really helped a lot with the anti-corruption court. It, 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 it differs day and night from what we had for judicial selections previously, uh, because we brought in a panel of independent international experts who had one role to um, basically uh, eliminate those participants of the contest who are not fit for their job. And they, they did greatly. And now we have the anti-corruption court that is finally working. So yes, I think it is a very good idea. And there's something around which the idea of uh, judicial reform, um, effective judicial reform revolves. And now what we're trying to do with, with these new bills and what the president tried to do is to bring is international, this international element 
and really make the whole judiciary go through it at least once. So we quickly um, incorporate these practices and, and finally make it work. Unfortunately, that did not work so far. Great, thanks, Michaela. Uh, Andre, uh, what wh what do you think of uh, Andy's proposal or this proposal to to um, use an international international courts uh, to get justice in Ukraine? You, you're a practicing attorney, or we're a practicing attorney. Did will it work? Oh, you're muted, Andre. Uh, yeah, thank you, Melinda. I'm I'm totally pro because we have this positive example of. Uh, well, anti-corruption court, and uh, generally, you know, there always any subject of transformation, any system to be transformed, it's anti-reformist by nature. It tends to serenity, it tends to its current state, and so it's either some internal revolutionary movement, which is probably impossible for the uh, judicial system, which is well, you know, corporate, and which is. Mm, well, retrograde sometimes. So uh, there should be some external political will and probably some external external participation. So those people from other judicial systems, other judiciaries, who have uh, well established uh, good will in uh, policy and uh, way of acting, they contribute much to the selection of Ukrainian judges and also for the qualification assessment, I think, uh, meaning sitting judges for the vetting procedures. Sure, sure, they should they, they, they should have some positive positive role in this movement. Okay. Yaroslav, uh, please, please jump in. Uh, does this idea have any resonance in Parliament? How do you guys feel in Parliament about this? Uh, first of all, we use our international partners in selection process of judges of anti-corruption courts and have quite good result. Now we have less question with uh, for decision of these courts than we uh, look on other courts. Uh, and we have um, not a big uh, group, but very influential group which use international court day by day, it's oligarchs, because all uh, oligarch cases, not solved in Ukrainian courts, they use in London, Stockholm, or other courts for their needs. If they want to have justice, to, to have a good, uh, a really um, decision in, uh, in the law system, they use international court. But because of that, um, uh, they clearly understand the oligarch groups uh, in parliament and outside of parliament clearly understand that using international courts um, can be alternative to Ukrainian courts. And this alternative are good for society, good for Ukrainian business, but bad for oligarchs' influence because they create alternative way to find justice. Because of that, uh, we have discussion about um, sovereignty, uh, about some international agents who pressure on Ukraine to, 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 to use international uh, filters in the in, in system of selection of judges. And it's quite tough discussion in parliament uh, um, because of that, yes, our uh, uh, groups uh, who are totally dependent from oligarchs don't want uh, to, to use this approach uh, involving international partners or in selection process or uh, using international courts for, uh, for our decisions. But uh, if uh, four years ago, uh, we only after revolution of dignity, uh, we even don't have a good discussion about that. Now we have a good example how it can work. High anti-corruption courts or, um, for example, case against uh, private bank uh, and other. So I think day by day, uh, in discussion like this, uh, in um, some uh, international, on some international uh, 
discussion, we will have a result and we find solution how we can use our help from our international partners and don't lose our sovereignty because it's one of the uh, nightmare of uh, our oligarchs. Thank you so much, Yaroslav. I, lo I love that contrast. So the, the oligarchs uh, want Ukrainian courts in Ukraine, but when they have their assets at stake, they want foreign courts. So that's, that's a really brilliant point. Thank you for bringing that in. Um, Michaela, bring us up to speed, please, on the current situation. So Zelensky tried judicial reform back in November. He tried to fire tainted judges and create credible judicial institutions. There were some big problems. You can you can detail that for us briefly. But uh, everything has sort of failed. Uh, maybe that that's too crude of a short and crude. But um, I know that there's new draft legislation, and we're waiting to see that. You've seen it. You called it flawed. What's in the draft, and what problems do you see with it? And what? How can it be improved? And specifically, how can the West help improve it? Well, yes, there is a bill. Um, well, it's not yet a bill. Uh, from what we, from the was in the media, because it was leaked in the media recently, uh, not the bill itself, but at least the, the certain points that are in the bill. And from what we know, from what we heard, as the civil society groups, it, it's, it's that it is it is correct. It is what um, the office of the president is considering at the moment, and. Uh, Unfortunately, it is not the solution that we would like it to be. Just to, just very quickly to a couple of steps back, uh, during the presidential campaign, we as civil society groups uh, created something that we called Agenda for Justice, where we described in detail what and how should be done in order to achieve successful judicial reform here in Ukraine. Um, then we met with then-candidate uh, Zelensky, who supported these, these ideas, and then introduced the first bill um, a very quite known bill 1008, as we call it, um, back um, in uh, autumn last year. Um, then it was adopted, not without discussions. It was not uh, inclusive, uh, the, the, the process of the adoption of the bill, and uh, it, had, it had flaws. Um, mainly, the main flaw was uh, given the same High Council of Justice that was responsible for the failure of ju judicial reform in the previous iterations, given it too much uh, power, too much control over the process of the implementation of the reform. Because what we want to, to have is to have the international experts sitting there, at least for once, helping us select good judges. What we don't really want is to follow in the footsteps and to kind of copy-paste the models of uh, judicial governance from uh, the um, international um, standards, because they work in, in, in um, established democracies, say the judicial self-governance rule, where there should be a majority of judges elected by the judges and the judicial governance bodies, which makes sense when you have, when you trust your judiciary and when you trust them to make decisions on their own behalf. But if 74% of the people in Ukraine mistrust their own judiciary, if the investors mistrust judiciary, if the judiciary itself is in a very bad need of cleansing, and if the number one priority is to actually renew the judiciary, it just simply doesn't make sense to give the same judges all the control over the over the process, the full control. So basically that what happened, and that what in the form of High Council of Justice, it had, it had superpowers to uh, establish the rules under which the new reform is being executed. And um, it basically sabotaged the whole process. It uh, kept the international partners from participation in the process of the selection of the High Council or the High Qualification Commission of uh, uh, Judges. So um, it once again showed that it is the enemy of the reform and not, the, uh, not somebody who will help in its implementation. Unfortunately, uh, uh, when the uh, the terms um, provided for by the law expired for the formation of such bodies, when the, the law basically was stalled, um, there was a new attempt at developing um, a law that would fix it, but it was never introduced. It was quite good. It was agreed upon with the international partners this time, but it was never introduced. Then there was a change in the office of the president, and then there was a change in in, in the cabinet, and then uh, now the new the new bill is uh, being developed, and it's it, it doesn't simply doesn't go near the effect of reform. It doesn't do anything in terms of. Um, renewal of the High Council of Justice. That is, again, once again, I have to stress, responsible for the failure of the judicial reform, that instead of um, firing bad judges and protecting the good independent judges, it goes after the really independent judges, it prosecutes them, and it really keeps the uh, bad judges in place. 
So um, now, it, if it is introduced in the same uh, way it is it is now, at least what what the press says, uh, and it is if it is adopted in the same way, it will be nowhere near the effect of reform, and something else has to be has to be done. So, so Michaela, just to dig in, because uh, most of us don't pay as much attention to judicial reform as you do. There's the High Council of Justice, and then there's the High Qualification Commission of Judges. The High Council of Justice hires and uh, they fire and discipline. Is that right? Absolutely. So they both uh, take a um, role in hiring judges because they have to double check them and then propose the president who formally appoints judges. Okay. And they they're responsible for their main responsibilities, the discipline and the firing of judges, which they are again failing of uh, doing properly. And the, the current body, the High Qualification Commission of Judges, does not exist right now. We're waiting for it to be reformed. Is that right? Right. So it legally exists, but it's not formed. The previous members were sacked by this law, which is good because, again, they're also responsible for the failures of the previous attempts at judicial reform. But the new ones were not selected. And the new ones were supposedly, they were supposed to be selected with the uh, help of the international partners, but that was blocked. Their participation was blocked by the High Council of Justice, and they went as far as to blame the same international partners that delegated them uh, for for this paper. So once again, uh, the High Qualification Commission that has to finally select the judges and to vet the sitting judges is not there. The reform is stalled, and um, there's no um, good way out of it that is proposed by the decision makers. It is proposed by the civil society organizations. We created something that is called um, the uh, now the judicial reform roadmap. We communicated it to the parliament. We communicated it to the office of the president. Uh, they know that it exists. They know what are the solutions that are proposed, but they're not following. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, do me a favor and, and paste it down below in, in the Q and A so our participants can see it um, sometime during this conversation. If you're just joining us, absolutely. We have four uh, phenomenal experts from Kiev uh, to talk about why Ukraine can't keep waiting for justice. We welcome your questions. You can either use hashtag Future Ukraine on Twitter or type a question below in Q and A, and we'd be delighted to pose that question to them. Yaroslav, uh, please tell us uh, your perspective on this bill. Does it have legs? Will it be signed into law? And is there any way to improve it between now and then? Um, really, we have a very difficult situation because uh, uh, before the election, any of our president uh, gave us promise to create an independent, professional and integrity uh, justice system beginning from uh, um, educational system for lawyers and uh, till the uh, finished decision of our uh, courts. But still, uh, every one of them uh, from Yushin Court till now, uh, to uh, Office of President, want to have some connection and some possibility to influence. For that, they need independent judges and independent courts. It's 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 like promise and reality. Uh, only under the international, only un, under pressure of civil society with help of our international partners, we have uh, some result in, in, in the process. Uh, if we look on our uh, political situation now, we in time for the local election and uh, really have uh, not a long period before this election, which will happen in autumn, but beginning in the end of summer. Uh, we have a very short possibility to, to start a systematic uh, judicial reform, its reality. And now we have a situation, we call it not we, but our majority pro president forces named it turbo regime approach, when many, many questions, many, many decisions made in very short period of time with many mistakes and uh, half done, really. And when you look back uh, to the situation where, uh, which was described by Mikhailo, we have example where very good goal, but really bad realization uh, in judicial sphere. So really, um, I don't see now possibility to a systematic uh, decision and creation really strong uh, 
uh, condition for uh, reform of justice. But I see, uh, and our four Zavolos uh, parties see possibility to uh, some very necessary uh, changes, for example, to creation independent procedure of selection of justice. And first of all, creation, uh, professional integrity and independence um, commission for that. Or it will be one commission, or it will be two commission, high qualification commission for judges and uh, high council for, uh, for um, uh, justice. Mm. What we can use, we can use, for example, what we use in uh, high anti in selection process of high anti corruption court. And uh, our fraction, our party even propose draft of law, which can be a basic. Uh, we, we elaborate uh, this draft of law in collaboration with our international, uh, with our colleagues from uh, civil society side, uh, the Euro. Uh, anti-corruption action center and our and it can be start for not systematic it still be like a very necessary but uh, not a systematic decision uh, but in reality we can see that under the pressure of uh, international uh, monetary fund and uh, other international colleagues we can achieve this result create uh, a more open more transparent selection process for judges uh, it's reality what we can achieve uh, we have many other problems like a level of our prosecutors uh, which too have inflation and very uh, very um, tough uh, inflation on a level of uh, justice but still uh, the like um, milestones and main uh, what we can do and what we need to do it's uh, change the uh, people in, in, in justice. So we really need a procedure for selection uh, more open and we have decision for that. Absolutely, absolutely. Let me bring um, Andre and Andy into this. Um, we've been talking about the High Qualification Commission and Andre, you are a former member of, of this, this body. Um, do you have any other thoughts on, on this new bill that's going around? Or are you Are you concerned that it gives the High Council of Justice uh, full control over the hiring, or what? What are, what are your concerns about this new bill? And then I'll turn to Andy. Well, it's not quite absolute control on the hiring uh, because because according according to this uh, not yet formally introduced bill, uh, well, the High Council of Justice has to appoint those sixteen members proposed by the Contest Commission. But uh, the matter is of interpretation, of course. And if the High Council of Justice uh, interprets it like we can, we, we can appoint them, but we can reject the appointment. Uh, that's a different story. Then they have absolute control on whatever this uh, contest body proposes. That's true. And, it's, uh, and probably this is the main flaw. Of the of the bill. Uh, as for me, I uh, I would be more happy if uh, some foreign some foreign experts were involved into the high qualification commission directly. At least some uh, either half or one third of the members would be I think would suffice. But uh, if we if we keep with this uh, proposed with this proposed participation in the selection of members of high qualification commission then probably uh, well the, the the decision the decision of this uh, contest commission should uh, have absolute power and uh, the high council of justice has only to endorse it because well uh, there is a big problem with the high council of justice itself because uh, at least two members of the High Council of Justice are illegally appointed for the second term, just because the name of the body changed in the Constitution with not, with not much difference uh, in the functions. And uh, also some 
newly uh, some newly appointed members uh, were highly criticized and uh, the integrity was put on doubt uh, during various selection procedures into the Supreme Court of Ukraine and in other procedures. So it's really a problem. And, uh, well, of course, you cannot eliminate a risk completely. Even for the high anti-corruption court, there are some strange decisions sometimes. But... Uh, you should at least decrease the risks to the last possible level. So as for me, uh, the, the lesser risk would be if, uh, foreign, if foreign experts were, were a part of the new uh, high qualification commission, of course. Thanks, thanks. Andy, how, how does the business community feel about the role of international experts in the selection process? Well, it, it's all about trust. And I think, um, you know, it, it's really regaining that trust. I mean, we've seen the numbers and uh, there is no trust or the trust is, is, is very low. You know, 74% uh, don't, don't trust it. And I think Ukrainians and, and the business community don't, don't trust it. Um, in terms of the, um, the HCJ, the, the High Commission on, on, on Justice and the HQCJ, the High Qualification Commissioner, Committee on Justice. So we had a meeting with um, uh, Andriy Kostin, who is Parliament head of the um, um, the law, the legal uh, law enforcement committee. And it's something we're also discussing with him at the moment. But, you know, yes, you know, the business community does feel that, you know, if you get um, some heavyweight international, um, you know, judges uh, into the system, and um, that, that, that would boost confidence. Um, you know, as I mentioned with the football referees, um, you know, it's somewhat of an analogy there. And I think, you know, we, we have, you know, so many members that, that are still, you know, stuck in courts and, um, you know, looking for, for justice. Uh, many, uh, all kinds of um, commercial disputes. Um, but even, um, you know, tomorrow we have, we have a case in, in court uh, with one of our, um, uh, a member of, uh, called the Atlantic Group, not the Atlantic Council, but the Atlantic Group. It's a uh, it was one of the first, it was a member of the, the American Chamber of Commerce for since the early 90s. And so uh, it was founded by, by an American, Andy Bain and Serhii Staritsky. And Serhii Staritsky was found shot dead uh, three months ago in the home of the former foreign minister. And, um, um, and now, you know, that, that's a case that we're also watching and the company and the family have asked us also to, to you know, watch this. and. Um, when we met with uh, the general prosecutor, Irina Benediktova, I, I mentioned this case to her. And tomorrow, um, you know, there's an appeal on, on the hearing regarding the bail. Um, so it, it's just, you know, that the whole perception because that the trust is so low. And I think, you know, now it's really, you know, looking at how do you gain the trust of the business community, of, of Ukrainian citizens to, you know, what, what's supposed to be the, 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 the top institution that, that's justice, that brings, delivers, uh, justice. And um, I think, you know, if, if there is an international uh, element to it, I, I'm pretty confident that that would boost um, some of this trust. Um, and I think, you know, it's definitely worth, um, um, you know, a, a road worth taking. Um, why hasn't been this done uh, so far? I think, you know, Yaroslav mentioned it because, you know, some of these people will have to give up uh, the control. Uh, and, you know, it's, you know, when you, you don't have control, and then if you're up to no, no good, you leave yourself you know, vulnerable to, to ending up um, on the wrong side of justice. So I think you know, that this would be a really positive signal for Ukraine as an investment destination mm -hmm. to show that you know, it, it can do it. And President Zelensky has sort of played with the idea, you may recall in, um, in Davos in January, uh, when he was talking about sort of investment nannies. I mean, he also mentioned you know, the possibility of giving uh, jurisdiction to uh, the courts of um, English law, uh, but again, you know, it, it is there is a constitutional element uh, to this. You know, uh, that there probably would need to be some sort of changes to the um, the constitution. But um, from an investment perspective, that this would definitely be the right message to send to investors that Ukraine is an, a destination where where you can invest. Absolutely. Okay, I, I have some excellent questions from our audience. James Road Moore wants to know uh, to Andy, how is the business community lobbying the authorities to reform the judiciary? Do you find them receptive to the arguments of the business community, bearing in mind how central 
improvement of the investment climate is to the president and the government? Yeah, um, I think in terms of the, the dialogue we have on, on a B2G um, level, it's, um, you know, they're, uh, they're listening. Uh, they're not always hearing, but they, they, are, they are listening. Um, you know, just two weeks ago, we had a meeting with um, uh, general prosecutor, uh, with five different business associations, Irina Venediktova. It was actually organized by um, Mikhail Saakashvili, uh, who, who, you know, he understands the issue. Um, and, um, you know, he brought us all together with the general prosecutor. So they, they seem to be open. Um, as I said, again, you know, we had a meeting with the uh, parliamentary committee, uh, Andriy Kostin. So, you know, they are, you know, at least listening to, to what, what the, the, the voice of business has. And, um, you know, we have over 50... Um, uh, law firms um, that, that are members of, of, of the AMCHAM here in Ukraine. And, you know, there, there are, um, you know, over 1,000, 1,500 lawyers. And they, they, these are some of the best lawyers that have the real, you know, practice of understanding, you know, what, what are the, um, um, the challenges. So I think, you know, the dialogue is there. Um, you know, listening, I think now, you know, if we could get some, um, you know, real tangible results, I think that that would be the message that um, the business community and international investors would definitely want to hear. Absolutely. Yaroslav, question for you from uh, Mattia. Many fear that the new general prosecutor, Irina Ven Venediktova, would roll back on critical steps of judicial reform. How do you rate her first few months in office? Mm, disgust. Really? Disgust. Yes. Uh, our new uh, general prosecutors, uh, totally dependent in, and uh, it's a pity, but totally unprofessional. Uh, so I think it's not her goal to ruin, uh, first of all, uh, prosecutor reforms, but still uh, she does it. Uh, why? Because she don't understand how uh, how can be uh, how must be uh, independent and uh, transparent um, uh, prosecutor process in general. So it's it's very dangerous when we have uh, on so high position uh, not prepared for that people, uh, which is a main um, like a characteristic is uh, politically dependent in and loyalty. Uh, they they openly said uh, before I pointed my before her appointed, I uh, was appointed that they uh, that the main goal of uh, his uh, sorry her appointed is to to imprison uh, Petro Poroshenko. It's 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 not it's, it can be in in uh, in, in developed country. It's uh, show that uh, really we have politically dependent prosecutor. Uh, general prosecutor. I uh, I couldn't say that all office of general prosecutors now uh, is politically dependent. We have a quite good uh, people who was involved uh, in process of uh, prosecutor reforms. Uh, for example, in the sphere of uh, people rights, yeah, we we have some achievements. We have uh, Yura Belousa who quite good in this sphere. Uh, but uh, head of our uh, prosecutor office is unprofessionally and uh, dependent. So it's we we have several political cases uh, which are started by uh, Irina Venediktova when she was in uh, state investigating bureau, and now we have uh, like a process of development of uh, these cases. Then. Uh, uh, she become a prosecutor. So it's 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 a very weak uh, place of our judicial system. Uh, I totally agree with uh, with this question that it's it's one of the dangerous place uh, for our judicial system in general. Yaroslav, is it right to say that she stopped reform um, in the regional prosecutor general's office? Where where are we in that process? <laughs> She tried. I can I, I can say, uh, and uh, many many people who 
was dismissed by Ruslan Rebashapka from original level, now returned to prosecutors. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great challenge. I can say that I agree with all steps which was done by Ruslan Rebashapka, but in the sphere of um, reforming, uh, he was quite good and done a lot of good things. For example, invite independent, uh, not only international, but from civil society experts uh, to the selection commission of uh, prosecutors. And now it, it all stopped by Venedictima or in process of uh, frozen. Thank you. Uh, Mihailo, any, any thoughts on Venedictiva? Well, un unfortunately, I must say, I do agree with m the most things that Yaroslav had to say. Really, the, the most ambitious reform to date that was done by the previous prosecutor general, Ruslan Rebashapka, was is either stalled or, or kind of reversed or people are coming back. And the way the, the political dependence of the current prosecutor general is also obvious. And uh, yeah, and that's, that's unfortunate, but that's, that's where we are right now. And uh, also, I wanted to say thanks, thanks for sharing the judicial reform roadmap, just a small caveat about it. Uh, it is, we try to make it both ambitious, so something that is, uh, that we feel would work and would help, but at the same time, it takes into account the reality, something that is achievable now by general law. So that was the idea of the reform, to have four points that are absolutely necessary. You take one out and the judicial reform is not there, or it is damaged or, or endangered. But, of course, it is not the whole range of issues that have to be addressed. I fully agree that the issues of judicial education and the justice for business and some other things that we are really working on as well, um, they have to be addressed. And really, I do also agree with Andri. Ideally, we will have, at least for the time being, for five or ten years, uh, people, independent international experts inside the uh, judicial governance bodies, but that there are some constitutional limitations. and. If these things are not fixed right now on time, uh, maybe we're looking into, uh, for really achieving the justice, the real judicial reform, maybe we're looking into the necessity of the uh, constitutional changes once again to finally get it done uh, for real this time. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, here's a great question from Ed Chow. He says, and I think this is to Andy, um, isn't the concept of investment nannies directly antithetical to establishing the rule of law in independent judiciary? Has, uh, have the current authorities given up on judicial reform or do they not understand that this is the image that they're projecting? Yeah, I, th I think that, that that's a good and very important um, question. Um, I think, you know, the the image at the moment, it's, it, it's not been great. And um, it, it, in terms of, um, you know, there was a press conference earlier today. I mean, Ed, Ed probably is following this also about the... Um, the energy, the renewable sector, I and mean, you know, we're, we're on the threshold of potentially uh, a lot of disputes um, happening there uh, with these investors and, and the state of Ukraine. So I think that that's something we're uh, watching very, very closely. Um, I think, you know, it's unfortunately, you know, if it's, you know, number one top of our agenda of, of the AMCHAM and, um, you know, pushing for, for rule of law and, um, um, you know, reform of judiciary, uh, you know, we haven't seen that the top of the agenda for um, you know the administration and um, um, you know government and, and parliament at the moment. Um, I think you know that that really needs to, to, to change um, in order for you know the image to really be be um, put right because um, you know the numbers that, that they speak for themselves. You know the distrust is is massive, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that really needs needs to be changed. So I don't think it's any, no, nobody's looking for any preferential treatments. I think everyone's looking, not, not for religious, but for, for justice. And I think that, that that's the main thing, you know, justice for all. Absolutely. And, and let's remember, that was the enduring theme that brought people out to the Maidan. Uh, and it, it still hasn't been achieved. Um, I, I'd yeah. like to ask Andrea a question. And uh, Mihailo and Yaroslav, if you have thoughts on this, and Andy too, please jump in. So this is another question from Mattia. Uh, the creation of the High Anti-Corruption Court was hailed as a big success. Also because of the involvement of international experts, does the high anti-corruption court really deliver so far? When can we expect big judgments on some of the big fish on uh, Nazirov or Kononenko? Andre, do you want to start or Mihailo? Well, 
I, I can start if I, if Andre needs another minute to think. Uh, we as civil society see this as a great success for two reasons. One, the selection procedure. Compare it to the to the Supreme to the new Supreme Court, supposedly new one that we created recently, without the international experts, where at least a quarter uh, had a proven record uh, of quarter judges who were appointed there of uh, cases of, of, of mismatch between the income and the property of cases that the, the European Court of Human Rights said there was a gross um, negligence, negligence and denial of justice and so on. So really things uh, that uh, in any democratic country, uh, a developed one, uh, the judges with such a track record would not be um, uh, let anywhere close to, to the court building. Uh, I mean, maybe some special status, but not as, not as a judge. Um, so what I'm saying is, um, compare this to the Supreme, to the anti-corruption court selection, where there was zero people who were let in who had severe reservations from the civil society's side. Uh, that's, that's, that's day and night in terms of judicial selection. Yes, it does it make mistakes? It does. Does it make are these honest mistakes? We think they are. Are yeah. there some judges that are uh, not as good as we uh, would like them to be? Sure. Are there some judges that who, who issue some strange decisions? There are. But at least at the court as an institution, it works. Mm -hmm. It has delivered already three verdicts, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of um, uh, against judges or uh, about judges who did not declare properly or um, did not submit their electronic declaration, which is now a crime in Ukraine. And um, um, some big fish, I, I understand completely the uh, question. We're also uh, waiting for the first real results, but you have to also um, uh, think that you have to keep in mind that the, the, the court only started operating in September last year. And if for these big cases, obviously you, you have to start uh, all the court proceedings from the from the start when you have the case uh, transferred to the court that was previously heard by the other court. So it, it just takes time. But what, what we see is that decision making all this court is also is also day and night compared to what we had before. Great, great. And that's and that's only because thank you. And that's only because we had the this international element. Any other there was no no other difference other than this panel of people who had trust, who had uh, who were respected, who were judges or prosecutors in their respective countries in uh, Canada, Denmark, England, um, and, and three others, and then um, uh, who really made the decision that that made all the difference. And Great. that's something we want to scale. Thank you. Absolutely, Andre. Any other thoughts? Oh, you're muted. Okay, you're uh, for, muted. Me, uh, for, for me, as a member of the commission, uh, well, the whole selection procedure for the uh, High Anti-Corruption Court made a great difference. Because, uh, first of all, international experts, as a filter, they used this reasonable doubt concept, finally, which uh, actually I was fighting for for all the years in the commission, but with not much success. They had a veto right, and they use this reasonable doubt. They, so the uh, the candidate had to prove that he has his flaw, he or she is flawless, and not the commission uh, had to prove that there are some problems. And if there was some well, low pro <laughs> some property which uh, he or she could not afford. Uh, according to his incomes, or uh, his relatives could not afford according to their incomes, or the price of this property was really low according, uh, well, in, in, in comparison with the market price. All of this was quite enough to dismiss such a candidate, and it was great. And uh, so, at least in this part, this uh, the, 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 uh, this court shows some new quality, and I hope there will be better results. Of course, if we're talking of big cases, they are big schemes, and of course, uh, we could not expect the proceedings to be assured uh, just from the point of view of quality. It's not possible, but. Uh, well, let's see. For me, uh, the greatest success for this court would be if this court someone uh, in the future treats a case uh, against some sitting officials mm -hmm. and treats it, treats it with rigor and uh, audacity. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Uh, one, uh, one more question from our, our, our guests. 
Um, th this is a basic question, but it's important. It's hard to understand the qualifications for attorneys to become members of the bar in light of the online judicial education. What are the qualifications to become a judge? Uh, Mihailo, you were a, a former judge. Would you mind answering that? I'm sure. uh, oh, yeah. Uh, well, if you can start, Andre, I, I, I can jump in then. Yeah, sure. I will. Uh, I will just give some few uh, some some general points. So, uh, to become a judge in Ukraine, you have uh, you should have thirty plus years. You should be thirty plus years old, but less than sixty five years old. You should have five years of legal experience, or for high, or for high courts, it could be five to seven years, or for appellate court, it's seven years, and for the Supreme Court, it's it's 10 years of legal experience, including in the bar or in the prosecution. Uh, the general criteria for the judge are competence, uh, integrity, and, well, you should speak Ukrainian, of course. Uh, speaking of, competen of competence, it's not only professional competence. It's also, it's also personal competence and it's social competence. And, uh, well... What was good in the previous selection procedure held by the High Qualification Commission, that some state-of-the-art, highly sophisticated uh, procedures were introduced, like psychological tests. We actually use MNPI-2 test. We use a Big Five test and uh, some integrity checks just to see if the person is psychologically ready to become a judge. But the biggest problem is that, uh, well, for my colleagues, it was just the tests, not uh, risks. And even if a person was uh, non-suitable according to the test, uh, it was always, some people were always saying, but in the real life, it, it's never shown up. So instead of eliminating these risks on the, on the, from the very beginning, it has not been done. And the problem of the Ukrainian judiciary is also that we have very little filters on the entry uh, on the entry level on the first instance level so uh, people are invited to the system and they well the vices and the flows come to the surface that's the problem thank you thanks so much i, I have thanks uh, Melinda. If, if i just very quickly can, can jump in I, I could could not have done it better than andre uh perfect answer it's just uh, i want to show one example give one example of how it works in practice so all these demands or, or um, um, things that are on paper uh, that are requirements for a judge are good, but they're only as good as as uh, as good they're implemented by the people who sit in, in the commission. Just what, to give you one example, uh, when testing it was not the selection procedure, it was the the vetting procedure for the sitting judges. But then the judge comes to in, and she sits in front of the commission for the interview, and she's asked, uh, "Your Honor, where did you get your five apartments down in Kiev?" Two land, uh, no, four land plots and a huge mansion somewhere uh, in the Kiev Oblast, which is very expensive. You could not have earned this with all your money, we see all your income. And she says, well, um, long ago I went to German Democratic Republic, so it's Germany, and uh, I, I picked up berries and I said, it's Deutsche Mark. And I brought them back and I bought this all, all this property. And then she's green-lighted by the commission. Not only she's green-lighted and keeps her position as a judge, she then is selected by the judges to be the member of the High Council of Justice. And she's now a sitting member of the High Council of Justice deciding on who's going to be the next judge and who's to be fired. The problem is all these people, or very many for that um, um, reason, they are they have a sim very similar background. And you just can't let them decide on, on, you know, you can't fire somebody who has a similar similar background to yours. That's, that's, that's the problem. So that is why we need trustworthy, independent international experts at this point for the time being to solve this issue. Thank you. May, may I add a small thing? We had a situation, uh, same family, same property. Two people, uh, well, two spouses in this family are judges. So one was running for high anti-corruption court and was dismissed as a candidate by the international experts. Another one with the same property and the same problems was in the general qualification assessment procedure. She was okay. So that's, that's an example. Mm -hmm. I, I see another problem too, gentlemen. Uh, the legal circles in Ukraine are very small and everyone knows each other. Everyone went to law school together uh, and without bringing in fresh blood, it's really hard uh, to break those networks apart. Everyone protects each other and everyone knows each other. Everyone does business together. So I think that's another argument for the need uh, for internationals. 
Um, we have about four minutes left before we have to say goodbye. And I'd like to ask Andy and Yaroslav one more question. Um, Yaroslav, can we go back to the RADA, please? Um, are Who are the real reform players that we should be watching there? Um, are are there any unexpected people within Servant of the People who really care about judicial reform? And you said something interesting before. You said uh, back in November, the presidential administration was more interested in judicial reform. Was that a result of Bogdan? And then does Yermak have any interest in judicial reform, or is he just completely fixated on, on the Don boss? Uh, now we have worse situation than we have previously because when uh, Ruslan Rebushapka uh, was uh, uh, responsible for. Uh, reform in the sphere of crime and justice. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a good concept of reform in general, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, prosecutor, uh, reform of prosecutor office, reform of uh, um, some part of recommendation of other uh, civil experts in the sphere of justice. Uh, but then uh, Ruslan Bashapka firstly came to General Prosecutor Office, after that was dismissed. Uh, we lose a very influential player in this year uh, from the side of uh, Presidential Office. Um, now, um, uh, responsible for this question, take, uh, I can say, uh, Kharkiv Law School. Mm. Um, it's not uh, one person, it's, um, uh, it's many persons who are now work in State Investigation Bureau, in Office of President, and uh, they uh, really don't want to change anything, as I can see. Mm. But under the pressure of, first of all, IMF, they must do something. And because they don't have a concept, uh, they can easily take concept from our civil society experts and uh, do something, not uh, all in general, why they don't have really, I can see capacity for that. But some crucial things they can do under the pressure. If we are talking about parliament, um, uh, we have several players in this sphere, but not in, 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 in majority. Uh, Holos fraction, European uh, solidarity, other try to, to, to propose some uh, decision. Um, in, in, uh, we have structure of majority, then uh, all decision firstly, uh, Mm, create uh, all, all proposal create in office of president after that to postpone to to, to parliament so uh, firstly we must uh, have connection with office of president it's not a new situation because when we work with Mikhail or uh, even in RPR times, we work with parliament, we do uh, work with office of president Poroshenko. Why? Because um, it's like a symbolically, but uh, all our presidents try to uh, push forward uh, um, reform of justice. Thank you. One last question, Andy. I'm afraid I only have about 30 seconds for you to answer this, but you're a nice, fast speaker. Uh, can the IMF exert pressure to encourage proper reform? Well, I, I think that, that there should be uh, pressure. I mean, I, I raised this issue with Secretary Pompeo uh, here in Kiev in, in January. Um, I think, you know, we've identified this, the number one problem, the number one barrier to boost Ukraine's economy. You know, if we've pulled all forces together um, and really, you know, with uh, Western support also, I think it can be done. I think the problem, it's a huge problem. It's the number one barrier for economic growth in Ukraine. It's what's holding Ukraine back. I think, you know, if we all come together and we push this forward, um, we get some tangible results. It's doable. It's doable. We just need the political will. I, I think, you know, then, you know, we can see tangible results very quickly. And we can point to the High Anti-Corruption Commission uh, as an example that it is possible in Ukraine uh, to get the courts right. Thank you all so much for joining us. We really had a, a wonderful discussion. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Michaela. And thank you, Yaroslav. Uh, we will be watching this space. Uh, please continue to, to uh, keep us updated. And, and Andy, we would love to have a column for you on how courts would work outside of Ukraine. So thank you again. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you thank next you. time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. All the best. Thank you.